Hey everyone, Pastor Brady here. So glad that you are tuning in and checking out Christ Church. We pray that you are convicted and encouraged by the sermon that you are about to listen to. However, we do want to say that this should not replace your belonging to a local body of Christ. If you are in the Sterling or Rock Falls or a surrounding community, we look forward to seeing you on a Sunday morning. And if you're not in one of those communities, Again, really grateful. We pray that this sermon blesses you, but I want to encourage you to be plugged in and belong to a local body of church. This is not a replacement for that. With that being said, I hope that this sermon blesses you, and we pray that you are plugged in to a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. Our scripture for this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, I will be reading chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Now, if, if uh, you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to follow along. If you happen to have a church Bible in your hands, you will find this passage on page 573. Uh, if, if you don't often turn to Isaiah, it's, it's basically right in the middle of the Bible. So if you, if you turn... To about the middle, and if you end up in Psalms or Proverbs, go to the right, and if you're in Jeremiah, go to the left. The passage I'm reading is, uh, the heading is, for to us a son is born. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought contempt to the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide and spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. Every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts. We'll do this. Amen. With you all this morning as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. As we uh, get kicked off, I just I want to kind of say a, a general thank you. A lot of you have done a lot of extra things this last month as we've been in Advent season, so... Thank you for all of you who have, have gone above and beyond and helped us have a really great month here at Christ Church. Um, so thank you to all of you who have done that. As we get started this morning, I want to think about a word. The word is anticipation. This is a word I think can sum up the Christmas season a bit, is it a season of anticipation. Don't go too deep with it yet. I think very basic. As a kid, you anticipate Christmas morning. And for a month, you just look at the calendar and you're like, man, I want Christmas to come. One, because that means no school for a couple weeks. 
And so every day at school feels three times longer. You watch the clock because you know that day's coming where the bell rings and you're free for a couple weeks. And then Christmas Eve comes and you look at the clock and you're like, it's only 6 p.m.? It's only 6.15 p.m.? How did that last hour only last for, go for 15 minutes? And all of a sudden it's 10 p.m. and you try to fall asleep and you can't because you're so excited for Christmas morning. And then Christmas morning comes and you wake up and your mom and dad are still sleeping. And you're like, come on, <laughs> come on, let's go, it's Christmas. Mom and dad and mom and dad are like, leave me alone. It's 4.30, like it is not time for presents. But then, <laughs> amen. <laughs> But then on the flip side, anticipation can also not bring a bunch of joy. It can bring anticipation. Time for a moment of honesty. How many of you still have some things to do before tomorrow? <laughs> some things to buy, some things to wrap, some things to cook, some things to clean, because in our mind, we have that perfect Christmas pictured and we're anticipating it, but we also are like, well, what if my kid doesn't love the gift that I hope they love? What if they don't respond the way that I'm dreaming they're going to respond? What if when my in-laws show up, they're like, this isn't as clean as it should be? And all of a sudden, we're playing these things in our mind, and this anticipation is actually bringing us anxiety because we have this perfect picture. Will Christmas be as special as we hope? This morning, we're going to talk about anticipation. Anticipation can sometimes be like an adult waiting for Christmas and being like, I don't know. But sometimes anticipation can be what gets you through. I remember sometimes as a kid, you're looking at the clock that last week of school and you're like, man, this week's awful. But I know Friday, I get two weeks off. I know Christmas is coming. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the kind of anticipation that gives us hope the kind of anticipation that allows us to go through the hard things of life, but go through them with joy, looking forward to something awesome. We've been going through our Advent series, Perspectives, where we are looking at different passages throughout the Bible about the birth of Christ. And this morning, you heard that we read from Isaiah, and we're going to talk about the perspective of the hopeful. The hopeful, those who are anticipating what is to come. And as we will see, the people of Israel, they had, they had some really rough things about to happen to them. But this news of the Messiah would give them hope. You could say the same thing for us. We have rough things happening around our lives, but the news of the return of the Messiah gives us hope. And so my, my prayer this morning is that we find comfort in the hope. We find comfort in the anticipation that, that God makes his promises and keeps his promises through his Messiah, through his son. So let's pray and we'll dive in and take a look. Lord, on this Christmas Eve, we, we praise you for what we're celebrating. We thank you for the birth of your son. I pray that as we look at this passage that we have heard sung, we've heard prayed, we've heard preached many times. Lord, I pray that our ears are open, our hearts are open to what you would have to say to us in, through this amazing passage. And remind us of who Jesus is and what he accomplished. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for how sure it is and thank you for the birth of your son. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start this morning by looking at the promise of certain joy. The promise of certain joy. So let's look again at verses 1 through 3. It says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of the Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Uh, typically, when you hear this verse, when people bring this passage up, they, they don't include verse 1 a lot. It's background information. So they, 
we jump typically to verses two and set two through seven. But the reason I wanted to include verse one is to give us a little bit of context. If you're newer with us, typically what we'll do is pick a book of the Bible and we will preach all the way through it. And we're a little under halfway through the book of Genesis is what we're normally doing right now. But since we've been in our Advent series bouncing around a little bit, I think it's important that we have a little bit of context for what we are reading. So a little bit of background on the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is what is known as a book of prophecy. Isaiah was a prophet. And he, this book is what's called a major prophet. That does not mean he was more important than the other prophets. Major simply means long. He was a longer book than the other books. So there's 13 minor prophets. They're all on one scroll. The major prophets each get their own scroll. I, so I, maybe we should change the language from major and minor prophets to long prophets and short prophets, but then people would be confused of maybe this prophet was only five foot eight or something. I don't know. Um, five foot eight, that's not that short. Uh, but I meant four foot eight. You know what I meant. But Isaiah is a book of prophecy. And what is a, what is a prophecy? What does a prophet do? Typically, when we think of prophets, we think of people who are told about the future, and then they tell you what's going to happen in the future, and then that happens. And yes, that's true, but I actually don't think that's quite the right definition of, of a prophecy. A prophecy is the word of God then being told to the people. So a prophet is told something from God. God says, hey, tell people this. And then the prophet tells the people what God said. And so sometimes it's, here's what's going to happen in the future. But sometimes it's just, here's what's happening right now. Here's the meaning of what's happening right now. Or even here's the meaning of what happened in the past. It's not always about the future. Now, sometimes it is, and our passage today is very much about the future. It's looking forward to the birth of Christ. Now, Isaiah prophesied at an interesting time. He was right before the people were going to go to exile. And why were they about to go to exile? They had been really unfaithful to what God had called them to do. Back in Exodus, God made a covenant, he made a promise to this group of people who he just saved from slavery and was like, here's my end, here's what I'm going to do for you, here's what you have to do to uphold your end of the covenant. And there's no surprise here, the people do not keep their end of the bargain. They don't obey, they worship other gods, they, they give in to the temptations of their time, time and time again. And so God actually, in Exodus and also in other books of the law, he promised the people, if you break the covenant, judgment's coming. You will go into exile. Things will not go your way. And the people break the covenant. God gives them about a million chances. And then finally, it's exile time. And Isaiah, right before the exile, he's prophesying and a little into the beginning of the exile. And throughout this book, and this is an idea I want us to hold on to, he talks about what's called the faithful remnant. Now, what's that? That's not language we typically use. A remnant is a small amount of something that remains. And so kind of a silly example, if you are boiling pasta and it's time for you to strain it and you miss and all the pasta falls into the sink, and you catch a little bit of it, and there's like five noodles in your pot, you look at it and say, that is a remnant of pasta. Got it? That makes sense? Uh, like I said, silly example, but that is what a remnant is. And so the remnant of Israel, the faithful remnant, while so many people abandon God, abandon the law, abandon what they should do, there is a faithful group of people. This faithful remnant who stayed true to the word of God, who continued to obey God, who continued to trust that, that, that God is good and continued to trust in him. And it's to those people that God makes a promise. And the promise is that they will be given certain joy. They're going to also go through the exile, the faithful remnant. They're not getting out of it. God's not like, hey, okay, so here are the people that are going to be punished, and you've been good, so you don't have to go to exile. No, they're also going to go through the exile. But they're also told, for you, the faithful remnant, joy is coming. But what's interesting is when you look at verse 1, and even throughout our passage, the verb tense is interesting. So we're going to do a little bit of grammar. Stay with me. I promise it's interesting. 
when you look in verse 1, it says, in the latter time, he has made glorious. That's a weird sentence. I don't know if that struck you when Jay was reading that sentence, but it's a weird sentence. That's not how we talk. We, we know when we learned grammar in school, the tenses, it's past, present, and future. If we're talking about things that will happen in the future, we use future verbs. So if I were to tell you that uh, my parents and I, in February, uh, we're going to go to my, with my parents to Wisconsin for a weekend. I would say we are going to go to Wisconsin. I would not say, in February, we went to Wisconsin. You would be then confused. Am I talking about this coming February? Did he go to February 10 months ago and for some reason is telling us about it now? Like, what happened? But we see here, God says, in the future, in the latter time, I did this. And you're like, that's weird. Why did you mix the tenses? Well, this is actually what is known as the prophetic perfect. So there, there's another tense. There's a few others, but there's one called the perfect. Perfect is another form of the past. And so what the perfect is, is an action that was completed completely in the past. So instead of saying, I was building a house, you would say, I built a house, right? That, that means the house is completely done. You started and it ended and you were done. It was all in the past. And so the prophetic perfect is looking towards the future and saying, this event, this promise of God is so sure, it might as well have happened in the past. It might as well have been completed in the past. There's no way this is going to happen. We, we can't talk this way. None of us can, right, as humans. We, we can't even say that about something that's going to happen later this afternoon. This communicates that God is so sure about what is going to happen, there's no possibility of it not coming true. And this is hard for us to imagine, not only because we don't operate this way, but because we can't operate this way. No matter how sure we are of something, like I can't tell you for 100% certainty that I'm going to watch the Browns football game this afternoon, and that's less than two hours away. I don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe my power goes out. Maybe my internet goes out. I can't guarantee my safety on the road. Any number of things can happen. James talks about this in the New Testament. He says, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I heard a, a pastor once say, and I've said this here, is there's no one whose life can't be turned upside down by just a phone call. Like we think we can guarantee what's going to happen. We act like we can guarantee what we know is going to happen, but we can't. Like we're just human. We don't know. We, any number of things can happen. When I was in restaurant management, this is a little bit of dark humor, so I apologize, but my employees and I, when we would leave for the day, we would often say, hey, see you tomorrow, unless I get in a car accident. Like, it was just this reminder, and it was dark, and like new people, when a new employee would start, they would hear it for the first time and be like, what is this place? Why am I here? But in a sense, that's, that's true of all of us. We think, I know what I'm doing in the morning. I have these plans for later this afternoon, but we don't know what's gonna happen, but God is so sure he can guarantee it so much that he can talk about the future like it's the past. He can say, hey, later in the future, this happened. That kind of boggles our mind, but he, has, he is so sure that even though everything is about to look uncertain, all these people are about to go into exile, that those who remain faithful, they will experience joy. There is no doubt about it. They will experience joy. Not they might experience joy. They will experience joy. No matter how bad this looks, and maybe you think, well, yeah, but they didn't know exile was coming, so they're, they're not shocked by this news. All you have to do is look at chapter 8. The heading of chapter 8, it says, the coming Assyrian invasion. They're told not that long ago, hey, you're about to get into exile. And you hear exile, you hear, I don't know if my family's going to make it. 
What's gonna happen to my house? What's gonna happen to my job? What's gonna happen to these people that I love? They don't know what's gonna happen. They know bad things are coming. And then in the midst of that, we get this verse and these verses in uh, two and three where you see joy and light and rejoice and joy and glad. And you're like, this doesn't make any sense. We're about to go to exile. This is not the time of joy. This is the time to fight. This is the time to get mourn and get upset that bad things are coming. But the people who have seen the light, and the light is the Lord, seen the light, seen his truth, seen his grace, they know that joy is coming. We see that the, it's the people who one time walked in darkness. They've seen the great light. Right? When you're kept in the dark, that means you don't know something. When you see the light, that means you are now aware of something. They are now aware of the goodness of God. They are now aware of the grace of God, and now they will experience joy. It's coming. The joy is sure. Look at verse 3. It's, it's crazy how much joy. It says you've multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. I just said most of the people have stopped obeying the Lord. It's a small remnant. And God says, the nation's going to increase. They're like, increase? We're decreasing. And we're about to go to exile. Where's the increase? If anything, God, I don't know if you know this, we might get wiped out. God says, no, you're about to increase. You're going to increase eventually. And the joy is going to come with it. And not just any type of joy. He points to two types of joy. He says, with, as with joy at the harvest. If you talk to a farmer, you can talk to our, our elder Jay as a farmer. Harvest is a joyful time. That's when all the hard work, when, when the things have gone right, when the rain has come, when you've put your blood, sweat, and tears into your work, harvest is when you get to eat. It's when you get to feast. It's when you get to feed your family. It's, it's payday. Harvest is a great time. And in that culture, it was even more important. That truly is what kept their economy going. And also, they're glad is when they divide the spoil. This is the picture of war. War is horrific. It's so hard and things happen and people die and it is a hard thing. But when the victors are there and they get to divide the spoil, when they stand on their victory, there's joy. We won. And God's like, you're going to have that kind of joy. Again, put yourself in these people's shoes. And maybe that's not that hard because we see suffering around us in our world and we see suffering in our lives and we're like, how can I experience joy? Here's what's going on in my life. How can I experience joy? Joy probably doesn't seem possible for them because exile's on the horizon. So they may ask, we may ask, how is this going to happen? How can God guarantee my joy in this situation? Well, God gives them the strategy, and the strategy is powerful victory. Verses 4 and 5. For the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, for his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire." We're told that those who are suffering, those who do not seem to have hope, they're, not, they're gonna have joy because victory is coming. They're guaranteed a powerful victory. The strategy, and this is a great strategy, is that God's going to win. It's a pretty easy game plan for us to follow. You heard in those verses, it never says, and here's the strategy, you better really start training. Because if, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to lose. God's not like, all right, so if, if you don't keep your end, I don't know what I'm going to do. So please help me out here. No, God says, I guarantee the victory. It's not dependent on a particular people. This small group of faithful remnant people, they're told that God guarantees the victory. God will do it. And God getting the victory means the people get the victory. To use another analogy, if you watch any sports, after a team wins the championship, it's not only the starters, only the people that play that get rings, that get trophies. Even people that sit on the bench and don't see one second of playing time get a trophy. They get a ring. 
They, the victory of God is the victory of his people. And that's really good news because if, if it was on our shoulders, that would be a lot of pressure. But God's like, I got this. I promise the victory. And he uses this illustration. He says, on the day of Midian, the victory God is going to deliver will be like that day. And so the question is, well, what's that day? Well, this is a reference back to Judges chapter 6 through 8. And we're not going to read all three chapters of Judges. This is the story of Gideon. If you don't know this story, you should read it. It's, it's a wild three chapters. There are some crazy things that happen. But I want to talk about a couple things. Judges 6 1 says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. We have a similar situation. People doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord, going into exile for a period of time. Now, this was only seven years. The people in Isaiah, they're about to go into exile for 70 years. So it's a little bit more on a grand scale. But this is a similar situation. The people have sinned. They are receiving the justice of God. And after those seven years, God comes to this man, Gideon, and says, it's time. Let's go get the victory. Let's defeat the Midianites. Let's then take back what is ours and you will be saved. And Gideon's like, got it. I got 32,000 people strong. Let's go to war. And 32,000, that's a pretty substantial number. You feel pretty good. You're like, we, we got a good, a good group here. We got a strong group. Got some strong guys here. We got great weapons. We're going to go win. And God comes to Gideon and he says the opposite of what you would expect. He goes, that's too many people. You have too many. I don't know if you're familiar with war, but you've never heard any general or any ruler of a nation go to the leader of the armies and say, you really have too many soldiers. You have too many resources, too many weapons. You should really use less. If we're going to win, we want to use less of that stuff because that's not a good strategy. But God goes to Gideon and says, you have too many people. And so they whittle the army down from 32,000 to 10,000. Are you happy, God? That's a lot less people. And God goes, mm, still too, too many. You still have way too many. Because here is the problem. If, if they go with that many, they're going to walk away from the war and go, we just won. It was me. We actually didn't even need God's help. We could have done this the whole time. But no, we, we need to be able to give credit where credit is due to the one who gives the victory, God himself. And so through this, again, we're not going to go through it, but a wild situation. Basically, Gideon whittles the army down by who drinks a certain way out of a river. And the, war, the army at that point is only 300 people, 32,000 to 300. And then God goes, perfect. That is a great number of people to go win a war. I don't know about you. If I was in Gideon's shoes, I would have been like, what? No. Can we go? Can we use the, how about the 300 people can go home and we use 31,700? Like, let's use the ones that have left. But he uses the 300 and they win. God gives them the victory. It's a mighty victory. It's a powerful victory. It's a surprising victory. And God here in Isaiah says, in that same way, you're going to also get a victory. You're not going to expect it. You're not going to see it coming. It's going to seem so unlikely, but I promise there is a powerful victory coming. And the question for them is, do they trust that the Lord will provide this victory no matter how unlikely it seems? We have the same question in our lives. The question is, do we trust that the Lord is the one who will win in the end no matter how unlikely it seems? Do we really trust that? Day in and day out, do we trust that he will win? The question boils down to another question. Do we believe that God is in control? Do we believe that he has all of this in control? And the question can be asked on a grand scale. Because we see war, we see horrible atrocities, we see oppression, we see natural disasters, we see, see violence, we... Just turn on the news and you just see horrible thing after horrible thing after horrible thing. Is God really in control? And then we look at our own personal lives and we have personal tragedy. We have health concerns. 
people that we know and love that have gotten phone calls and have gone through things that we never could have imagined. And then we have our normal everyday life difficulties and stresses and anxieties and depressions. And we can wonder, is God actually in control? Romans 8, 28 says, for all things work together for the good of those who love him. And our question can be, how? Do you know the phone call I just got? How can that work for good? How can God use this for my good? It takes trust. It takes faith to know that God is in control and that he will win no matter the circumstance. To have a victory you need a strong leader, right? You need that person at the point who has the strategy, who can carry it out, who can guarantee what's going to happen. And so who is going to see to this victory? Well, the victor is the promised savior. Let's look at verses six and seven. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We're given in these two verses a lot of information about this promised Messiah. I, He packs a lot of information into these two verses. But maybe the most surprising is the first thing we learn. We're told, guaranteed joy. I know you're about to go into exile. Guaranteed joy. We're going to win the battle. We're going to win the victory. Great. Who's going to do it? This baby. (laughs) You're like, what? (laughs) That I was expecting something totally different for the next sentence. But to us, a child is born. This baby is here. And while the nations rage, while the nations fight, while the enemies close in, while they do not look like they can be defeated, in this case, Assyria is getting stronger and stronger. You turn on certain news outlets and you can look at any number of quote unquote enemies that are getting stronger and stronger and more and more resolve. And it looks like there's no way this is going to end out well. But God says, I got the victor. It's this baby. It's this child. And we're told some incredible things about this baby. First, we're told that the government will be on his shoulder. That's a much different position than even being at the top of the government. Because if you're the person in charge of the government, if you're the president or the king or whoever it is, When you die, your position will just be filled by someone else. Or even if you just get outvoted or if there's any number of an uprising, any sort of things, you can be replaced. But if you're the one who is on their back, if you go away, the whole thing crumbles. So Jesus isn't simply just at the top. He's holding it all together. It's on his shoulders. Like he's carrying the whole government. He is carrying the world on his shoulders. And then we're given the four most amazing promises of who this Messiah is. First, we're told he's a wonderful counselor. The word wonderful, we, we use it often in, as we talk, but the word wonderful means more than simply really good. The Bible in the Old Testament, it uses the word wonder. It's usually talking about something divine, like you're wondering at something. It's not natural. It's supernatural. The word wonder is used in books like Exodus when it's talking about the the 10 plagues that God used to save the slaves. So they looked on those with wonder. And what is wonderful here? It's the counsel of of God. He is the wonderful counselor. If you've ever been to a counselor, you go to receive wisdom, to help work through some things that you're going through. And God doesn't just have normal, everyday, natural wisdom. He has wonderful, divine wisdom. Reminds me of Solomon. When Solomon goes to God, or God comes to Solomon and says, I'll give you whatever you want, just ask. And Solomon asks for wisdom. He doesn't just get normal, everyday wisdom that everybody has. He's given wonderful wisdom, divine wisdom. It's more than natural. And then we're told he's a mighty God. This verse, there, this this phrase, these two words often get 
twisted, not twisted, but used in uh, everyday sermons or different things to mean he's just a warrior, which is true. That is what it's saying, but it's saying a little bit more than that. He's not just some mighty, strong warrior. He's the mighty God. If you flip one page to your right, chapter 10, verse 21, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. That phrase is used to talk about God the Father. And he says, this baby is mighty God. He doesn't mix words here. He doesn't mince words here. He's not saying, hey, and he's going to come from mighty God. No, the baby is mighty God. This baby who was born 2,000 years ago is mighty God. He is more than simply a mighty warrior. He is the mighty God, and he's everlasting father. Ancient kings often called themselves the father of their people. There's language they often use, but here's the thing about earthly kings or even earthly fathers. At some point, they pass away, right? Just like we all do. And the new king could come in and say, I'm the dad now. And the old king couldn't come back and say, no, it's still me. He's gone. That's the natural progression of things. And father is often used about God, but he's not simply just the father for the time. He's the forever father. No one can replace him. No one can take his place. And when father is used in the Old Testament to talk about God, it's, it's to indicate his care and his gentleness for his people. Think about the list so far. Government on his shoulders. He's the wonderful counselor and wise. He's the mighty victorious God. And you're like, ooh, sound, this guy sounds a little intimidating. He may not want me on his team. He may not like me. He may not want me. And then we're told, yeah, but he's also your dad. When you think about father, you think, yeah, dad is really strong. Dad can be really intimidating. But dad loves me. Dad cares about me. And so he's also the everlasting father. And finally, he's the prince of peace. We've already looked at war. This passage talks about war. We're talking about the exile But this list ends with the prince of peace. Peace is more than merely the end of war, but it's a new position we have with God. We weren't at peace with God, and then the prince of peace is going to come, and he's going to make us at peace with God so we can be in harmony with God, and that is because of this baby. We were created to be at peace with God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he made people to be his co-laborers, co-heirs with him, to be in right relationship with them. But all people have sinned. We've all said, thanks God, but no thanks, and we've gone our own way. We do things we shouldn't do, and we don't do the things we should do. And in that, while we were sinners, Christ came and he died for us. This baby that we're celebrating this weekend, he came and he died for us. He took our sin and shame on the cross and he gave us his perfect righteousness. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see the things that separate us from him. He sees his son, which unites us with him. He sees what allows us to be in his presence. He sees what allows us to be at peace. And that peace is what the Bible says surpasses all all understanding. It doesn't make sense in worldly terms. Though our passage today ends by contrasting him to other governments and other kingdoms. They're all temporary. I don't care what peace treaties are signed. They're all temporary. New kings come in, new old kings go out, peace treaties, throw them out the window. They don't last. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert about America. It's not eternal. I know sometimes we behave like it is. And we get worried. Elections come up and we're like, yeah, but the future of our country and it's all going to... America's not eternal. Our hope is not in that America turns it around and becomes this great Christian nation and America is the kingdom of God. No, our hope is in the actual kingdom of God. Which, praise God for that. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go, but of the increase of Jesus' government and of his peace, no end. 
You look, there's been some amazing kingdoms throughout history. There's been some amazing kingdoms. And at their height, they probably felt invincible. You could include ours in that. They all ended. There was always a time when those kingdoms come crashing down. America's going to be no different. But our hope is not in America. Our hope is in that his government, his peace, his justice, his righteousness will never end. And how can all that be true? I love how this passage ends. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The reason this will happen is because God will do it. That's what I want us to leave with this morning. That we can be made right before God because God will do it. We can live without shame because God will do it. We can be forgiven because God will do it. The church will continue to march forward no matter what the odds say they are because God will do it. One day, justice will be completely satisfied because God will do it. And one day, peace and joy will reign forever and ever because God will do it. That is the hope of Christmas. We will never reach the point where God goes, Man, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to win, but that really threw my, threw my plans off. Now I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't overcome that. That'll never happen. God will win. God has won because God will and has done it. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Not, okay, I've mostly done it and I hope I can finish this later. No, it is finished. And on Christmas morning, we do see that God did it. He sent his son, and that son has made a way for all of us to be made right with God. Will we repent? Will we believe? Will we trust in that Savior, that son who was born, that king who has come, who promises us joy, who promises us victory, because he is the victor. Let's pray. Lord, on this Christmas, I pray that you remind us that you are the one who already has won. And one day you will complete the victory. You will return. And as we wait in this moment, as we wait through tragedies and hard things and day-to-day -day life and sufferings, we know that one day all of this will be set right. One day all of this will be made new. And we yearn for that day. We cry out for that day, Lord. We look forward to the day where we don't get those phone calls anymore. We cry out for the day where we don't turn on the news and hear of horrible atrocities. We cry out for the day where there's no more war. We cry out for the day when you return and you set all things right. And we know it will happen because you've promised it will happen and you will do it. We thank you that your son was born in the most humble circumstances, that he lived the perfect life and he died the death that we deserved and he rose from the grave and he defeated death and hell and sin and Satan and he allows us, any who would repent and trust, to be made right with you. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. I pray as we celebrate this day, that we celebrate his birth, I pray that we celebrate what Christ truly has done for our lives, that yes, we enjoy the festivities, we enjoy the food and the music and the presence, but Lord, I pray ultimately that we find our joy and our peace in your Son. And it's in his mighty name we pray. Amen.